The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. To get a million and a half new homes on stream by the year 2030, Ontario has opened the door for homeowners across the province to pitch in. Laneway houses are one way to do that, and tonight we'll ask, can these little homes really make a big difference? First up, fresh off the wind to get Mississauga on track to being a standalone city, Mayor Bonnie Crombie is here to explain why she's now set her sights on leading the Liberals at Queen's Park. It's Tuesday, May 23rd, and that's next on The Agenda. It looks as if the mayor of Mississauga would like to become the Premier of Ontario. Bonnie Crombie was once a federal Liberal MP. She's been the mayor of Ontario's third largest city for almost a decade. But now it seems she'd like to give provincial politics a try. Crombie announced today she's setting up an exploratory committee as a necessary first step to running for Ontario Liberal leader. And she joins us now here in studio to explain why. Welcome back. Thank you. Good to Thanks see you again. Me. How long have you been thinking about running for this job? I will say to you that um, not that long. Um, I have been receiving messages from prominent Liberals and Ontario people, residents from on, from Mississauga and from Ontario, encouraging me to consider it. We have accomplished a significant amount in Mississauga, and um, as you know, I've kind of butt heads a few times <laughs> with the premier. I've noticed. And so people saw that me as that kind of individual that wouldn't back down and would hold my ground. And I think they like the way I manage things. I'm a centrist, as you know, and suggested that I consider taking this leap. Let me follow up on that. The premier and you had a fairly nice announcement last week, yes, along we with did. the mayor of Brampton and the mayor of Caledon, saying Peel Region was going to get a divorce, mm -hmm. something you'd been working on for a very long time. So that happened. What influence did the fact that that divorce announcement happened have in your ultimately deciding to go for this? And let me say I was very grateful for the pre to the Premier for having done the right thing. I know that something he and I have talked about. I expect that he and Hazel talked about it in her final days when he she was spending a considerable amount of time with her. He indicated to me that it was the right thing to do, that he believed in smaller, flexible, nimble, innovative, uh, smaller cities um, as I did. And we all know that our agenda was to build more housing, more affordable housing. And the best way to do that is to cut the red tape, cut their duplication, cut down costs, and that would facilitate the permit process. So I think he agreed with that. I said, the uh, the faster I can get this done, without, I can get it done faster without the region, we can get more homes built without du but, the duplication but, of a second level of government. But the fact that it happened, did that sort of clear the decks for you to run for this job? I think it gave me pause considering um, what more needed to be done at the city as a result of this process. And then I came to the conclusion that for the most part, my job was done. It's not like I'm going to be arm wrestling the Mayor Brampton in the back rooms. We're going to have the financial experts and the, and the legal beagles, our lawyers, uh, doing the negotiations. We're opening our books to the auditors and to the facilitators. And I think they will agree that our city is well run and uh, and fiscally responsible, uh, and I, I expect that that will put us in good standing. As you know, we have funded the growth of the region of Peel, uh, about 70% of the cost for the past 40 years, and since Gra Brampton's growth the past 10 years, that number has come, come down about 60% of the cost of the region of Peel, and the incremental 84 million transfer payment I make. Okay, I'm going uh, I'm I'm, I'm to interrupt <laughs> you here because we don't want to. I'm not going to relitigate all that here. I want to ask you about the Liberal leadership, which you're going for right mm -hmm. now. The other candidates in the race, Nate Erskine Smith is the only guy who's officially in, but Yasser Nakvi's interested, Stephanie Bowman's interested, Adil Shamji's interested, Ted Shu's interested, and they have had many months head start over you. Yep. Now, I'll acknowledge you're the biggest name in the race, but putting an organization together, you can't do on a shoestring. You gotta, 
How much do you think your late start affects your ability to be competitive in this race? I think it's certainly a factor, and that's why this is an exploratory committee. I do want to go out. I want to speak for the, to the residents of, of Ontario. I want to speak to people in small towns. I want to better understand their priorities and how I can solve them with my approach, because my approach is quite different than the other candidates. As you know, I'm the one with the experienced leadership skills. I'm the one who's managed a government, who has a $4 billion uh, budget to manage, both operations and uh, with the, our capital campaign. I bring a different skill set. I bring a different level of experience. I like to think it's strong and experienced leadership, but they bring different skill sets to the table as well. And I'm hoping to ignite a conversation among uh, people of Ontario, more so than just Liberals, to talk about the path forward to a, I don't know, a brighter, more inclusive, more equitable, fair Ontario. So when you so say this is an exploratory committee, is there anything that could happen during the course of the next couple of months that you explore that might make you ultimately conclude I'm not going to get in. Yeah, I think that's possible. I think we could determine that there are th these individuals are significantly ahead that I couldn't catch up, or maybe I could bring them to my position, my more centrist positions, and we could create a platform that would appeal to Liberals across the province. And and you, I wouldn't need to be in the equation whatsoever. I could go back to Mississauga. So I have to make that calculation. I want to speak to people. I want to. I want to have. Uh, productive and constructive dialogue mm. with these candidates. How to much see time are you giving yourself? Oh, I would say weeks, not months. But you know, I would say by or by midsummer or July-ish, I, I will have to have made a decision. I think that many of them are working on the ground, are far mm. ahead of me, and uh, obviously I benefit from having higher profile and um, name recognition across the province. But there's a lot of on the ground work to be done as well, and many of them are well advanced of me at this point. Well, that leads to my next question, which is, why would you want this job? Well. Look, um, I'm interested in bringing the province back to the centre. The current administration, um, I have some issues with their approach and the way they do business, and they're far too far to the right, the opposition too far to the left. I'm a centrist, I'm fiscally responsible, but yet I'm the... Uh, very socially progressive. So I'd like to see more transparency, more accountability, um, and tighter fiscal management all at the same time. I will tell you what the turning point was for me, if that interests mm -hmm. you. I've met people in Hamilton, I've met people in Ottawa. In Ottawa, I had a young woman come up to me and she said, you're my mayor. I trust you. I have confidence in your leadership skills. I like your management style. You're a strong fiscal manager. And I agree with your, uh, your decisions and have confidence in them. I don't want you going anywhere. And I said, you know what, I really appreciate your comments. Thank you so much. I said, what if I took that same management style, that same fiscal responsible approach that you define, and what if I applied that to towns and municipalities right across the province and to the province's finance in general? Do you think we all could be better off? That same transparent, accountable approach that you have credited me for, which I am very accountable and very transparent. What'd Would say? we be better off? And she said, a light went off, I could see it because you've got me. You're right. Please proceed. Okay. I, I, the reason I ask the question is you are arguably vying for, or ultimately potentially vying for, the worst job in politics today. Why? Because the Ontario Liberals are, you know, according to so many people in this province, a spent force. You've come third, no, you're not you yet, but the Ontario Liberals have come third two elections in a row. That's never happened in 156 years. The current Prime Minister's lack of popularity at the moment, you'll excuse me for saying, is an albatross around the neck of the Ontario Liberal Party. The NDP have a pretty new leader who is yeah, she's terrific. young and dynamic and respected and mm -hmm. could make an alternative case uh, to Doug Ford if and when that time comes. So how would you convince us that this job that you are vying for is worth more than a bucket of spit? <laughs> well, look what happened federally. They went from, uh, Justin Trudeau took them from fifth place party to majority government. I think that can be uh, that can be repeated. I think they were only in third, weren't they? Oh, I think they were in fifth. 
Really? I got. <laughs> well, look you can look that. back and check. Uh, you're check the, it out. You're no, the that's true. They went, you know, they I went think, from well back to, the, to majority. Correct. Back. I think that needs someone the, to ignite the brand and to reinvigorate the brand and have those policy discussions at the local level. And it takes someone of profile and preeminence. And I think that I have worked hard and built a certain profile and 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 certain reputation. And I think I could be that person. Now, if we get into this race and we have great discussion and debate and other other individuals, other candidates are willing to put forward the centrist views as I am, because I believe in governing from centre or slightly right of the centre, if we can come together, maybe I'll have done my work. Maybe we can come together and create a policy platform that will take Ontario back to the centre and I can go back to Mississauga. You do raise the issue of whether or not the Ontario Liberal Party over the last... I don't know how far back you want to go, certainly five years. Has it been too left-wing and too woke for your tastes? Yes. And you intend to try to do something about that? <clears throat> the Liberal Party moved too far to the left. They were in competition with the NDP. I think we need to bring people back to the center. Uh, there are a number of Liberals that lost their way and voted Conservative. Um, and you know, there are red Tories that would put their faith and confidence in someone like me who they see as fiscally responsible and a centrist. There are blue liberals that are perhaps voting conservative today that would come back to the party. So I think I bring a lot to the table in the center. I think the party is better, best positioned governing from the center and campaigning from the center. And that's where I would take it. That's where I'd like to see it. I think that's where the natural roots are. Let me ask you about something that a former liberal cabinet minister at Queen's Park told me when I asked him about you. Interesting. And I said, okay, I mean, taxation, housing, roads, public transit, obviously, as the mayor of a big city, she Rose understands. Roads, source. She knows these issues very well. What about health care? What about education? Right. What about justice issues? What about the huge panoply of other provincial mm -hmm. issues that you would have to know as a premier that you don't necessarily have to be all that up on as a mayor? Mm -hmm. Can you do that? Well, of course I can do that. I, I see day to day people come to me with their problems, no matter what they are. They don't distinguish between level of government. I hear about it. I see how overburdened our health care system is. I see our education system where there are too many uh, students in one classroom, the size of classrooms, the fact that online learning is the, is the direction the province seems to want to go. We have to work with our educators. We have to work with our health care workers, um, our nurses, our doctors. I think the defining issue in this next election will be leadership and it will be about fixing the crisis in our hospitals and in our schools. Can you tell me, if, it, if leadership is the issue, tell me one significant thing you disagree with the current Premier of Ontario on. Transparency. Transparency and accountability. There are certain things in the way they were done and all will raise Ontario Place, the Green Belt, the MZOs, close relationship with the development community is a big concern, but it could have been less of a concern if there was more transparency around the decisions that were made, more consultation, whether it's with local communities, community groups, or uh, First Nations groups, whatever it might be. I think sunshine, sunlight is very important on decisions that have been made. People don't understand why decisions were made. Why was the new consortium at Ontario Place given a 99-year lease? Why are we moving the Science Centre to Ontario Place? These are decisions, there may be a great rationale behind them. In fact, I happen to be aware that the previous board supported the decision to move Ontario Place, but Ontarians don't understand that, and no one's been willing at this point to explain it to them. So there's a lack of transparency, and there's a lack of accountability. Same with the green belt. Maybe there's good reason. Maybe some of that land is serviceable. But what, was consultation done with the local community? Was it made public that uh, individuals would be told that this land could be rezoned? I mean, there are certain questions at, at play here that I think a greater level of transparency and accountability it, it should have been um, should have been cited. Okay, fair enough. But uh, people may infer <laughs> in those answers. Oh. So she wouldn't move the Science Centre to Ontario Place, or maybe she would not allow further development in the Green Belt. Can they read that into your answer? I very well may have or may not have, but I think a certain level of consultation was important with the local community. This is a gem that's being moved from Don Mills to the centre of, well, to the waterfront of Toronto. 
Was that mm. the right decision? And how does the local community feel about it? Maybe it needed a rebuild. You know, these are just more consultation needed to have been done. Same with the green belt. It's it was the process. It was the lack of transparency around it, and that was part of the key of what that individual said to me in Ottawa. You're transparent. You're accountable. You're very accessible and open. And people like that about me. I'm also very forthright and direct. So I know it's butted heads with the premier a few times over my forthrightness. A few times, but in the main. I mean, at least in the public appearances mm -hmm. that I've seen the two of you conduct, the press conferences mm -hmm. you've done, you seem to have been able to work with him reasonably well. Is yes, that fair we're very to say? collegial. We are. So you. We you just have a different opinion on which direction the, the province should take. And I often say to him, we both want the same thing, the province to prosper. We would just get there differently. We have a different approach. Do you think he's done a bad job over the five years he's had the job? There are many decisions I wouldn't have made. Like, certainly they're not addressing the health care crisis, not in the way that Ontarians are comfortable. They're introducing too much private medicine. It makes people uncomfortable. There hasn't been any pro public consultation consultation done on this you know our hospitals are overburdened and underfunded and let's address why let's fix the crisis that occurs in our healthcare system and in our hospitals same within our schools and education you know there are lots of changes that can be made but let's start with size of classrooms there are too many children um, in one classroom um, you know I would even look at whether or not we need a uh, grade 13 again uh, you, our youth are spending five years, whether in high school or in university, but they're certainly not ready to go to university. These are these are decisions that are sorry. These are um, policies that need to be reviewed. Um, and like, I would like to consult with educators um, and the people and make some decisions about how to go forward. Let's just. I mean, we don't want need to have a. Policy discussion right now. This is we're just launching the listening tour, the exploratory tour, and I I wanted the opportunity to speak to professionals and speak to people in the industry and the sector and speak to Ontarians on their views and what their issues are. I, I, I totally appreciate that you're not rolling out policy today. That this is the beginning of a process, not the middle or end of a process. Having said that, you just sort of threw out the notion that you think that there's too much privatization in Medicare taking place right now, and I suspect people will want to know. What does that mean? What exactly are you worried about or what are you, what do you see happening out there that concerns you? Well, w what we're concerned about is um, people being charged for medicine that will move away from universal medicine, that people be required to to pay for their surgeries or will be upcharged for um, that particular surgery because it's in a, uh, a private hospital or a private outsourced facility rather than in a publicly funded hospital. This is a real concern to Ontarians. It's part of our values and our principles to have universal uh, medica medical care. But as a general philosophy, do you oppose publicly insured services happening in privately owned and operated clinics? Well, it depends. I think we have to look at the funding model. I have to speak with the hospitals and I have to, I would have to ensure that these upcharges aren't occurring. And there's a real concern among people that they will, that they have and that they will. I, uh, again, in preparation for today, did some emailing back and forth with somebody else who knows you. And this other person who's been in liberal politics for 50 years said to me, why would she want to leave Mississauga right now? She's finally been able to get independence for Mississauga. Why would she not want to usher that in and really be the mayor of the independent sovereign republic of Mississauga, as you have <laughs> wanted to be for, for a long time? Uh, can you answer that question? Yes, so certainly. So we've accomplished a lot in Mississauga, and uh, of course we're growing, we're developing, and there's always a lot to do, and I take a lot of pride in Mississauga. I love the community, I love the people, I loved being mayor. And yes, this was a significant accomplishment, historic accomplishment, epic in fact. So when I see really you filled, oh, I'm gonna get there. <laughs> I think, I feel like I fulfilled Hazel's legacy, something she's been advocating for, well, since at least 2000, but we know that she also went head to Ahead with Bill Davis when he formed the region, which was at the expense of Mississauga to fund the growth of Brampton and Caledon, but I know we're not going to go and, there. And, and all she did was become the longest serving mayor in the British Commonwealth thanks to Bill Davis. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, we don't know that yeah. we can credit Bill Davis for that. <laughs> we credit Hazel McCallion for that. And so I, I, you know, I feel that that has been achieved and it was the right thing to do. And the Premier knows it's the right thing to do and I thanked him and I was very grateful. He too believes that smaller cities can be nimbler, that are more cost effective, more cost efficient. We can cut red tape, eliminate duplication and all the duplication with the region appeal going to two levels of governments for approvals and getting another municipality to buy into your development ideas. It's, it, 
you could see there was a lot of opportunity for, for friction and tension, and there was certainly that. But that's been accomplished now. And now, and now the door is open for the experts to take over, for the, for the lawyers and for the accountants. We're going to open our books and they'll be audited and I'm very proud of uh, how we manage our books and how fiscally responsible we are. Um, and the city manager and the legal team will take over in the negotiations. Mayor Brown and I are not going to be arm wrestling in the back room. You could sell tickets. <laughs> I'm you could sell tickets, I'm, I'm sure telling we you. Could. We had I'm, him in here last week. He'd, be, he'd look forward to that, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm sure he would. However, so, I mean, I will be there for Mississauga. I'm not going anywhere. Well, if I decide to get into this process and register, I will take some time away and probably, um, I will take some time away and give it my best. And if I'm successful in... That's the question, though. Is that, is that, in, are you going to step down as mayor? Like, would you resign no, as mayor? No, definitely not. Um, all of us in this race are, you know, the two of the other candidates are members of parliament. They don't have to step down. None of us are independently wealthy. Um, I intend to fulfill my duties, roles, obligations as mayor, be present for council meetings and for briefings for my commissioners, and receive delegations as mayor mayor, I'll cut back on the after-hour activities and weekends. You know how many numerous events I attend in the evenings and on weekends and some of the cultural festivals and banquets and ribbon cuttings and parades, etc. Um, I'll cut back on some of those and meet residents of Ontario in their small towns because what I think is also important, uh, I didn't mention this earlier but I should now, is that Liberal parties moved away from rural Ontario. Look back to Bob Nixon days. Mm. You know, we were a party that catered to all people in all communities, just not urban centers. And I think we need to go back to that as well. That would be part of the part of the uh, pr uh, p policy platform that I would create uh, should I move forward. I've spoken to a number of candidates, and a couple of them said that they authored uh, the platform for the previous regime that that spoke to rural issues, northern issues, and I said I like to see a copy of that because that's something I feel very strongly about why we don't appeal to rural and northern voters um, and that's something I would take very very seriously because we can't be a party of just urban voters yeah uh, last 20 seconds here and the answer you give cannot be Hazel McCallion okay what male political figure in history uh, has inspired you the most Winston Churchill, you know, even John Tory, I love how he governed. Um, you know, I think people have real comfort with him. Uh, people who are practical, can resonate with people, uh, empathize with people, those are the kind of mentors I seek. The real people who can empathize and feel the pain and compassion of others and that genuinely care. And I think there are leaders as such that were those individuals. But, you know, of course it's Hazel McCallion. You know I was going to say Hazel McCallion. That's why I said you can't say <laughs> Hazel. But it's true. You know, she was strong. She was formidable. She was up to any task. Um, she was brash and bold. And I'm all, I like to think I'm all those things. She I don't did her back homework. down. And, of course, yes, we did all learn. Do your homework. And, Indeed. And just uh, don't be second to none. <laughs> your Worship, I know you, this is probably interview number 23 Three. today mm -hmm. uh, as you announce your exploratory committee. So we're glad you made some time for us at TVO tonight. And uh, we'll see you somewhere down, down the road on the hustings. Thanks for the opportunity. For all the condos and subdivisions currently under construction in this province, the provincial government says it wants, and we still need, more housing. So, in addition to what developers are doing, legislation passed last year facilitates homeowners adding a laneway or garden house to their property. With us now on whether such units can play a meaningful part in relieving the housing crunch, we are joined in Sudbury, Ontario, by architect Angel Dimitruk. She's a partner at Third Line Studio. And here in our studio, in the big smoke, Greg Lintern, chief planner at the City of Toronto, Tim Park, director of planning services for the City of Kingston, and architect Christine Lawley. She is the founder and principal at Solaris Architecture. And it's great to have you three here in our studio. Angel, thanks for being there from the Nickel City for us. And I'll start with you, because we're going to be talking today about so-called laneway houses, coach houses, garden suites, accessory buildings, call them whatever you want. To what extent, in your view, are they a part of the housing crunch solution that we need in Ontario right now? 
think they definitely play a huge role in just the densification of neighborhoods in filling those uh, in-between spaces. Here in Sudbury, uh, what you'll see more of is secondary dwelling units, and we've allowed this. The city had uh, passed bylaws in 2018 and 2020, allowing for secondary dwelling units up to two secondary dwelling units on a lot, so a total of three residential units on one property. And you see, so uh, this is becoming kind of more popular uh, throughout the city. You'll see a lot of individuals that have detached garages on their properties. Obviously in Sudbury, uh, we have much larger properties and, and, and lots than down south. So we have that ability to may not have the exact same infrastructure as say a laneway house where you have that additional kind of street to be able to approach but with the larger size lots we can achieve that sort of driveway kind of throughout the deep lot there you know if you have something that's roughly 200 feet well now you've got that accessory dwelling unit that's at the back of the lot that can provide drive uh driveway to it and parking so i think it, it, it's definitely uh, a big need as it helps with, as I mentioned, densification and just uh, really creating that um, different housing types within your neighborhood uh, urban fabric. Good. Okay, Tim, your view on whether this is a big, medium, small, irrelevant part of the solution? What would you say? Um, I would say in the Kingston context, it's, it's certainly a, a part of the solution. I don't think it's the silver bullet to save the, the housing crunch. Um, what it does is gives opportunity for gentle intensification within existing residential neighborhoods. I hear that expression a lot, gentle intensification. Yes. What does that mean? Well, it, it means adding features or, or you know homes and uh, buildings that are of like nature. Mm -hmm. So you're not gonna get something that's gonna come in and be a mid-rise or a high-rise in the middle of a neighborhood you're gonna get a second unit or a backyard unit, which is much more in keeping with the existing neighborhood context and fabric, and it's a little less uh, invasive to the existing residents. So I do think they, they play an important role. Uh, I think it's best to have a variety of housing types in order to address the housing crisis, and this is certainly one uh, aspect that will help move towards that. Part of the mix. Part of the mix, Got exactly. It. Christine, your view on this. Well, my view is that we do have a housing crisis, but we also have an ownership crisis. And people want to own homes. It's a very North American ideal. It's part of our economy, is to own a home. So accessory dwelling units do add more units, but as of now, the way that the programs are structured is that those units still belong to the main parcel of the, the main house. You can't own them, can you? You, you could be the property owner, but you don't own the laneway house or the accessory mm -hmm. dwelling unit independently. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's part of the program that could very easily evolve. But right now it is adding that gentle, uh, gentle intensification that, that Tim mentioned. It's adding units where there's already great infrastructure in terms of schools and parks and shopping and neighborhoods. But ultimately, it doesn't add more ownership opportunities, which is something that, that can be fixed. Um, it's not a, a kind of infrastructural issue. It's, it's really about legislation. So, Greg, where are you on this? Well, we've all seen the cranes. Certainly in Toronto, you see the mm -hmm. cranes. Um, and you may have seen the odd really large house, sometimes pejoratively called a monster house, uh, but not a lot in the middle between mm -hmm. those two extremes. And I think, We've we've heard a lot in the last in the last couple of years about the missing middle. So that's where the, the laneway suites, the garden suites, uh, multiplexes, other forms of low-rise housing they kind of fall in that middle. Um, and there is a need for not only for more supply of housing, but there's a need for ground-related housing. Not everybody um, wants to live in a tall building, and, and and not a lot of people can necessarily afford. Uh, to get into uh, places of choice and uh, across the city's neighborhoods. A lot of our neighborhoods, uh, vast majority of our residentially zoned neighborhoods, only permit single, a single unit in a house mm -hmm. until recently. Mm -hmm. So that's what this is about. It's mm -hmm. about expanding housing options, housing choice for more people. 
uh, for for more people of more of variety of need and means. And uh, is it going to solve the crunch? Nope, it's not going <laughs> to solve the crunch. Um, but um, you, it's a complex problem. Is it a part of the puzzle? It's, it's part of the puzzle. It's a complex problem. You don't approach a complex problem with a single tool. You you approach it with a variety of tools, and and it's important to have this in our toolkit. I think right across the province. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Okay, let's put the accent on Kingston here for a second. And Sheldon, I'll ask you to bring this graphic up because here's what's been going on in the Limestone City over the last many years. In 2019, we got secondary residential units in Kingston. In a detached building, they are, as of 2019, permitted a building akin to a separate laneway house. And in 2022, a third residential unit is permitted, that's up from two, in an existing building. Now let's flip that over and see what impact that has had. In 2018, they let 12 permits granted for secondary units. In 2019, 56 permits. This is now including detached buildings, so big jump there from 12 in the previous year. In 2020, 117 permits. But 2021, 98. 2022, 80. Okay, Tim, I don't know a lot about math, but those numbers look like they're going in the wrong direction. What's happening? Um... I, I would say that 2021 permits and the 2022 are reflective of the pandemic uh, because those are things that are coming out of the pandemic. Uh, the uptake on second residential units in the city has been growing. I think it represents about 10% of our total residential building permits at this time. So we have seen a fairly steady um, pickup on those types of residential units within our permit system. Okay, let's put the accent now on Toronto. And again, Sheldon, I'll ask you to bring up the numbers for Toronto because it was in 2018 that the capital city of Ontario first permitted laneway houses. 2019, the project was expanded citywide. And here has been the impact. 667 building permit applications for laneway homes, those permits were issued. 516 permits issued. 147 projects completed. 199 projects under construction. Okay, Greg, chew on those numbers and tell us what you infer from all of that. Well, it brand new in 2018 and expanded in 2019. So I think the city is kind of building, it's in that capacity building moment where more architects, more designers, more uh, industry contractors, and especially property owners are becoming more aware of this opportunity. And you can go there now in our laneways and see um, uh, people living and, and living out their daily life in, in laneways. I remember taking a bike ride in our lanes in 2017 and uh, great spaces, but nobody living there. And you can do that same bike ride today. And, uh, and it's a fabulous, I think, evolution underway. Is it gonna happen overnight? No, it's not, because I think it has to scale up. But the, you know, this is about providing and enabling the opportunity, which didn't previously exist. No, I get you. And but I think that's important. When you, when you consider that this city's got almost three million people living in it, and these numbers are, shall we say, modest, it looks like there hasn't been much uptake. Is that fair to say? It's it's fair to say, except that it didn't. It's it's something that had a cold start in 20, 20, uh, 2018, 2019. And then, as, as was noted in Kingston, the pandemic tends to make people pause. Uh, a lot of problems with supply chain, with labor, with contractors. Um, I think people will be getting into the opportunity more. And we've just introduced the permission in July 22 for garden suites. Mm -hmm. So that is something that's just coming on less than a year and already getting some interest in that and some projects under construction. Again, I just emphasize that this is a brand new thing. We wrote a report in 2007 and said, don't do this in Toronto. Mm. So it is something new to the consciousness. A bit of, of a culture of, shift of, necessary. It's a big culture shift. Yeah. Okay. Christine, are these places, do they tend to be affordable for the people who want them? Oh, I mean, it depends how you look at it. I mean, first of all, I have to say it's an amazing program and it is evolving steadily. You know, in November, they loosened laws, the bylaws, to promote um, more easily the development of these laneway homes. So that's something that Toronto's, you know, Toronto's moving. It's, it's just a slow uptake. But I think that generally the main reason, we get tons of leads for building laneway houses. The main reason people don't want to do them is the cost. They sort of think, oh, well, a garage is, you know, 100000 and 
So if I double it, it's 200,000. But a laneway house is going to cost half a million dollars at a minimum hmm. to build. Now I'd challenge you to find a condo to buy in Toronto for half a million dollars and you won't be able to do it. Harder to do nowadays. Yeah, now this comes with the land obviously, but um, as, a, as a, an alternate to buying a condo for somebody who wants to add value to their property, the, the laneway house is, is a treasure. It's a million dollar treasure sitting in your backyard waiting <laughs> for you to dig it up. But is it reasonable, Greg, to expect to be able to purchase, to, to construct and then purchase a home, admittedly a smaller home, a garden suite or a laneway home for $200,000 in this city given what real estate prices are? You know, I, I think what was pointed out is that the land value is taken out of this equation. So that reduces the cost of housing overall mm -hmm. quite significantly and puts it in a more competitive situation um, when you're dealing with, uh, with uh, condo development in the city. Um, you know, I, I come back to focusing on, on people with this question and how this might offer an opportunity for someone to help them uh, pay the mortgage. It might offer an opportunity for someone who has uh, intergener intergenerational living needs. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the grandparents out back, maybe the parents out back, mm. maybe the kids in the house and vice versa. Um, many of us, I'm sure many of your listeners have kids who are still at home and uh, maybe <laughs> there for a long time, uh, given the, the cost of housing. So again, coming back to the living circumstances that people are struggling with right now, giving people more options and more choices. Uh, definitely, you have to be someone of means, not going to deny that mm -hmm. uh, for this opportunity, but uh, it will address segments of the market, segments of the need of, of the housing challenge that we have, and that comes back to the toolkit. We need as many ways of getting at this as possible. All right, mm -hmm. let's go back up to Sudbury. Angel, tell us what the benefits are to creating another building on a homeowner's lot where there already is a house. I think it's really just, uh, especially when you're looking at neighborhoods, when you're looking at the housing crisis right now, affordability, if you're, you're maximizing that lot with an additional dwelling unit on it, you're, so you're reducing costs overall and you're just intensifying that footprint so that there's more, you know, you're closer to things, you're, there's less of that urban sprawl, which we see a lot of up north. Uh, essentially, everybody wants a lot of land, and uh, it it's obviously gets cheaper the further out you go out of Sudbury. Uh, so for younger, uh, younger people that uh, are just coming out of school or just trying to get their careers in place, they want to get a home. Even for rental, it's, it's, it's quite high. So for them to be able to afford to pay rent in, say, a more affluent neighborhood, somewhere that they'd really like to live, the, the rent would be quite intense. Whereas if you're if you have individuals that start kind of putting these lots these additional dwellings on their lots it's redu it's sort of a passive income for them and they could provide that reasonable rent for uh younger individuals with uh different income levels well let me pick up on that with tim in your experience do people who own homes want to be in a position of being sort of mom and pop real estate developers slash landlords? What I've seen is there's sort of two categories. Mm -hmm. There's the homeowner type, which I think is what you're describing, where the, you know they live in the principal residence and they rent out the second or the third unit. There's also the property owner type, which is they don't reside there, but they rent out the entire unit. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of two categories. In Kingston, primarily, the majority of the take-up has been on the property owners, so full rentals, as opposed to homeowners. But to some of the points that uh, the other panelists have made about for homeowners right now, where buying a home is perhaps getting a little bit far-reaching, this helps offset the mortgage mm -hmm. and the payments associated with that. And it also provides more rental units on the market. So which, people are game to do it. Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Christine, um, I want to circle back to something you said earlier. Mm -hmm. at, the, at the moment, you, you, if you're putting a garden suite in your backyard or something like that, uh, you can't sever that and sell that, can you, to somebody else? You're just no. a tenant at that point, Not right? in Toronto. Not at the not moment. Not in Toronto. No. Right. 
Should it be that way? I think it should. Um, I look at uh, London, England has Muse housing, which was old carriage houses behind the main house that are all mainly independent properties now and very, very affluent neighborhoods sort of within the main neighborhoods. Um, so I, I think they should be severed uh, ultimately if that's what people desire. But I think we need to see those laneway houses or those laneways becoming their own kind of streets mm. in a way. And um, as Greg had mentioned, you know, cycling down the laneways, you start to see people living and occupying and um, making their mark on those spaces. We'll see that more and more and it will become the next natural step. Any thought to that, Greg, allowing severance and purchase of those smaller suites on the edges of the property? Yeah, you know, first things first, we need rental housing in this city. Uh, more than anything else, we need uh, that flexible housing stock. We're not building enough rental housing for all kinds of other reasons that would probably take another panel to cover. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the provincial direction is certainly accessory dwelling units on the same lot. Uh, tethered to the main house for, for water and, and, and hydro. Um, and that's the principal opportunity here is I think to expand housing options through that means. Uh, there could be the odd, the odd one that you know, makes sense to sever, but the whole thrust of the, of the policy direction has been uh, rental housing and, and associating it with, with the, main, the main dwelling. Gotcha. Can you take us back to 1998? This was amalgamation year, I guess, right. for Kingston. What did you do in that city to kind of make all of this easier to have happen? Oh, well, um, I don't know if it exactly happened in 1998. Um, we actually just passed our consolidated zoning bylaw last year. You're it took, kidding. It took us 20 years. <laughs> wow. Why? Uh, it's just one of those projects that got pushed <laughs> off and off and didn't get done. But I'm very thankful we have one zoning bylaw now, not five. So one zoning bylaw instead of five allowed yeah. you to happen, but it took 20 years for that one zoning bylaw to be approved. It did. That's an, another story onto itself, absolutely. <laughs> another we're, we're, show. We're, we're, I, I, we've got lots of show ideas here for yeah. future shows, apparently. Uh, okay, do we have that problem when we went Mega City in Toronto in 1997? We, we uh, I would say, the, the ability to have this dates back to, I think, 2003, if, and I'm nodding at my planning, uh, my planning friend here. But uh, the city did not really get its act together until much more recently with, with laneway suites. Uh, we've, had, we've had permission for secondary suites, you know, house a, a, a unit in the basement for quite a number of years, but we had certain tests associated with that. So I would say a lot of hesitancy about this, and something happened, and I think it was the housing crisis, the housing challenge, the fact, frankly, that more people were feeling the affordability pinch than they have previously. Um, and, and not that a lot of people haven't been feeling that affordability pinch for a long, long time. They have. But old so habits die hard. Old habits die hard. And I think this evolution has picked up speed and people's values are changing, changing about it. The norms are changing about it. The, the way that people talk about housing today, um, it, that, that wasn't in the conversation the way it was maybe 15 years ago. And it's probably next to parking, unfortunately, <laughs> the, the number one issue. Thing. Let, let's go back to Sudbury. Uh, Angel, how about in, in Sudbury? Do, what is the sense at City Hall as to whether or not uh, the city mothers and fathers have truly embraced these new and different ideas in terms of dealing with the housing crunch? I think Sudbury is definitely uh, embracing some of these new ideas. I know even kind of the tiny homes concept is becoming a little bit of a popular um, idea throughout um city and in the uh in the zoning bylaws uh they're, they're looking how at tiny is a how tiny can, home incidentally uh i think roughly around 400 to 500 square feet that's tiny yeah <laughs> so and the idea the concept of that is really to uh there it's kind of this co-housing uh type of uh, format where uh, you may have kind of a commute the, the primary residence is sort of like has its communal um, kitchen and laundry and stuff like that and then your tiny home is uh, really for kind of your sleeping uh, you have a study area washroom uh, but it can get larger than that so uh, some some interesting concepts would be to essentially you know could you could you have a tiny home that's on a larger uh, lot and sever that lot and and you start integrating that into the uh, neighborhood fabric and, and it's really just creating 
different housing types, different housing options, I think is really what's important here. And as many as, uh, as, every, uh, as you've all said on the panel, that it's not so much that laneway housing is the, is the ultimate solution. It's just sort of that one piece that can start kind of helping towards uh, providing more affordable housing or rental options. Right. Greg, I want to ask you about whether or not you feel, as the chief planner for the City of Toronto, whether you feel as if you have in some respects lost control of the housing file in as much as the province has really told all of the municipalities in Ontario, get going. And if you don't get going enough, we'll just bring in a ministerial zoning order forcing you to get going. Do you feel you've lost control of the file in some respects? You know, the, the housing file is um, a multifaceted file. Um, so people automatically look to government and say, get going. Um, province sets some goals, sets some standards, um, sets some policy. It's a policy-led system in Ontario. Municipalities act on that. Um, in the City of Toronto, we approve, uh, on average, in the last five years, 28,000 housing units. That's an, a considerable, when you compare it across North America, that's a considerable number of approvals. Yet when you look down the other end of the pipeline, the completions are around 15,000 a year. Um, and that's not blaming anyone. That's just being upfront about the capacity of the system, of the entire system to build housing. Not enough not workers, enough drywallers, not enough, not right. enough okay. carpenters, uh, people coming through school, supply chain, um, the cost, the interest rates, the carrying charges that developers face. It's a big, complex system, and all parts of that system have to be firing up and working well to produce uh, the amount of housing supply that we need. I'd also say, though, that we need attention more directly and a more direct government role on affordable housing, mm -hmm. because the market, by its very nature, will not build intrinsically affordable housing at the rent levels that we need in the city of Toronto and, and of course across the province. And are they? Is this government doing that? This government is, is I think, challenged to support the amount of affordable housing as well as the federal government is challenged to support the amount, amount of affordable housing that we need. When you think about the direct and indirect programmatic support that uh, cities got back in the 60s and 70s around, uh, around uh, 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 interest rate relief and other programs that don't exist today, uh, HST uh, rebates, all kinds of things that are, I think, part of that toolkit that need to come to the fore. And at the end of the day, the taxpayer, uh, one way or the other, may have to may have to pony up a little bit more to make a societal, uh, you know, to recognize that this is a societal issue, mm -hmm. this is a societal problem, and that we all have to solve it together. Let's look at some stuff. And by that I mean your work, for oh. starters here. Shall we? Uh, we are going to look at what Design Magazine considers to be some of the best looking laneway homes in Toronto. And Christine, I think this is one of yours, right? Everybody here in the studio look at the monitor. Take us through this and tell us why you believe this to be a well-designed laneway house. Well, this was, uh, this was a, a laneway house for clients who are actually neighbours uh, of mine in, in the, the High Park neighbourhood. It's in West and, End, Toronto. Yeah, and they, they wanted this as a, a rental. They recognised that um, they didn't really use their backyard as much as they expected. They have a cottage. They spend a lot of their summers in, you know, the kids are in sports or they're out camping or playing, you know, up at the cottage. And so they kind of thought, well, let's use our backyard um, for something more intensive. Okay, so just so I'm clear, yeah. and Sheldon, I'm going to want you to bring that picture up again. Black and white rectangular lines, cantilevered second floor, right. creating an overhang. I mean, that looks like a great house. Thank Where's you. the actual house? So the actual house is behind this one. The actual house is behind this what we're looking at. This is a two-bedroom laneway house. Um, it's, you know, it's got really nice spaces. How and many square feet? Um, I think about 1,100. Okay. It's south-facing. So it's beautiful light, and mm. there's a little uh, garage that the main house uses as a woodworking studio. Okay. So we've got uh, a little bit of light industry and a little bit of residential mixed together, but this was a really, really lovely home to work with, and the clients had a beautiful vision for, for what they wanted to see when they looked out the back of, of right. their house. What did it cost? It cost uh, probably... 
you know, closer to the three quarters of a million mark. Mm. Yeah. That's Toronto. Yeah, but that's Toronto. Yeah. And we had an amazing builder who just every detail was perfected. Okay, we got so. more. Let's And if, I want some feedback from everybody on this stuff here. Let's bring up the second one. There's a, another a very modern looking home, straight lines, prominent garage, big windows, so lots of light. And this again is, I guess this is you know, a butted too. Boxy. They're boxy. Yeah, they, they are boxy. They are yeah. boxy. The zoning bylaws are very specific. Mm -hmm. So if you want to max out your square footage, which you need to do to make it affordable, you do end up with boxy designs. Okay. Yeah. Bring it up. Sheldon, bring it up again if you would. Angel? Okay. I want you to be hugely critical here of your colleagues' <laughs> work. What, what do you think of this? I think it's a it's a beautiful design. I mean it it definitely when, when you think of uh, a laneway house, this is sort of a, a great concept for, I, I mean, I would want to purchase this. I, I think it uh, it has a, a nice slick look to it that would really cater to a lot of your younger uh, generations that they just like simplicity um, and something that just looks modern and, and slick and that adds to the character of the neighborhood. Okay, let's, uh, Tim, I'm going to get you to do, and these are not Christine's, no. just the first Only one was. Only the first one, yeah, yeah. the first one was. Here's another one. Sheldon, let's bring up picture number three. Okay, here we go again. Uh, you know, rectangular shaped, white and beige, laneway house, sort of a central structure, windows facing the laneway and the side. Okay, Tim, your view on this. What do you think? Oh, uh, I, I think the design, I could probably work a little bit more like the first two. You're a being bit so better. diplomatic. I am, yeah, I am. you are. You don't like this um, that much, do you? Well, beauty is in the eye of the <laughs> beholder. Now, now one okay. thing I think that's interesting, we tend to talk about um, these laneway houses on an individual basis. We actually had a project in Kingston. It was a former school site that sold. And within that school site, we created 23 lots. And on the lots, in the front, two units. And on the back, garages two spaces and above and a, a detached unit. So in total, 69 units hmm. within a former school site. So as a project, so it's actually turned out very well. There were freehold and the laneways and such are, are condominium elements. So when I saw the first two photos, that's imme immediately what my mind went to was that was very similar to the design we were we were looking at there. Right. Okay, I'm going to see if Greg is going to be a little less diplomatic about what he thinks about this one here. Greg, here's one brown siding, long <laughs> rectangular windows. Uh, I guess it's sort of along the ground floor. Kind of looks like a, the other ones are very boxy. This one is a barn shape. And again, really abutted to what looks like a garage of the house, and it's right on a laneway. Uh, okay, great. Your thoughts on this? Somebody's home. It's fantastic. I think, uh, uh, you know, in, in we, were, we were saying the size of these things, like uh, if it's 1,100 square feet, that's the size of a large condo in Toronto. That's two or three bedroom condo in mm -hmm. Toronto. Grade related housing. They can walk to parks. They can. Uh, walk to the main street for shopping. They can um, probably get away with not owning a car, I would say, because yes. so many of these places are in approximation, or in approximation to uh, transit. But again, I'm going to infer from the way you describe this place that you don't love the look at it, the look of it, but you're right, it's somebody's home. You know what, I'm going to leave design to the architects. We have a <laughs> fabulous, we have a fabulous uh, architecture guys, and designer guys, community yeah. in Toronto. And this <laughs> is just going to make the, the juices flow, I think, for the incredible creative industry we have in Toronto. Okay, we got a few minutes left here. Let's do a few more pictures. Christine, I want you, if you were to talk about, now this is London, UK, these pictures we're going to see here. Mm. So, Sheldon, bring up the first one. This is pick five. What, it would, what do we call this? Like cobbles, a, cobble, yeah, cobblestone, square? Yeah, um, this would be an example of a yeah. muse, which, mm -hmm. is, which is sort of what, what I imagine our laneways might look like. That looks nice. You know, eh? in 75 years from now, right? When when the Laneway House program is fully developed and basically operating as as its own city. But those know? really look like homes instead of boxes, right? Yeah. Do you yeah. like that? Do you like that better? Well, they were more original uh, buildings. London was just generally denser than Toronto is, so a lot of the muse mm -hmm. homes are converted carriage homes with um, servants' quarters on top. Huh. So they're. They're historic buildings that are being readapted. Okay, Sheldon, right. picture six, if we could. Okay, Angel, tell me what you. Again, we've got uh, another Muse look here. So there's two-story housing on either side, cars parked right along the street. Again, cobblestone 
uh, pavement. What do you think of this? I, I lived in Europe for a couple of years and uh, I've always loved uh, just the way the cities are kind of developed and formed. Um, it, to me, this just looks like a, a nice streetscape that is, is walkable and uh, has great character to it. So it, it's, it definitely has a nice feel. It does look homier, doesn't it? Okay, bring up yeah. uh, Sheldon, if you would, picture seven. And here's one more. Tim, describe this and tell us what you either like or don't like about it. Well, what, what I like about it, and again, I'm going to say this is likely a, a European example, and mm -hmm. I think in the European context, this is the type of housing scenario you see. I mean, everything is very walkable within their cities. Mm -hmm. uh, they were designed originally for people to live in, not for cars, which is what most mm -hmm. North American cities mm -hmm. are designed around. Um, and, you know, for us to shift to this sort of mindset, I think you're seeing it in the larger cities. You're certainly seeing it in Toronto. You're seeing it in the downtown parts of, of Kingston, the older parts of Kingston. But I think as a whole, it will be very difficult in North America to shift the mentality to this in the suburban areas. Let me get uh, Greg on that. Can we bring up picture seven again? And, you know, Greg, take a look at this. We're talking cobblestone streets. We're talking lots of windows, so presumably lots of light getting into these places. Two stories. They really look like homes as opposed to boxes. Can we do this in Toronto? Ironically, people get on a plane and they go to Europe to see this, and then they come back home and, and, uh, and wonder why can't we have that here, and of course we can have that here. I think that evolution, uh, while, while it um, may seem slow, we've got, I think it's 19 mall sites across the city of Toronto that are going from a single-use, let's go shopping experience to a live, work, play, uh, transit-connected uh, experience where you can maybe have a home, maybe en go and enjoy the public realm, much the way you see in that shot. Uh, and that's the evolution, I think, that's that's underway in, in urban North America, and you're seeing that in the city of Toronto. Great. I want to thank all of you for coming uh, into our studio here at the middle of uh, the capital city and up north in uh, Sudbury, Ontario. Angel Dimitruk, architect, partner at Third Line Studio. Tim Park, who's the Director of City Planning Services for Kingston. Greg Lintern, Chief Planner for Toronto. And Christine Lawley, Solaris Architecture. Thank you. A Toronto firm specializing in laneway houses. Uh, you've made us all a lot smarter over the last half hour, so thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate Thank it. You Thank you for having you. us. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, May 23rd, 2023. The builders of the Eglinton Crosstown project in Ontario's capital city recently confirmed that more than a decade on, they still won't be ready this year. Tomorrow, we'll ask, why can't we ever seem to build the things we need on time or on budget? I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow.